This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. It is officially my favorite time of the year because the Daytona 500 is just around the corner and is coming up on Sunday or potentially Monday based on the weather forecast down in Daytona. And we've got the full menu of odds now posted at FanDuel Sportsbook for the Great American Race. We're going to break down the Daytona 500 for today by talking to Dr. Nick Giffen of the Action Network, getting his read on general betting process for Daytona, talking about some drivers he's keen on entering this year, and of course, his favorite bets at FanDuel Sportsbook sportsbook for this week's race this is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network and FanDuel research my name is Jim Sonis I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel research joined here as mentioned by Dr. Nick Giffen check him out on Twitter at Rotodoc and you can of course find his work at the Action Network where he is a predictive analyst he's on the running hot podcast the stacking Denny's podcast as well busy guy as always so Nick I appreciate the time how you doing today Ah, uh, man, it's Super Bowl week. Oh, wait, no, it's uh, Daytona 500 week. I'm mixing up all my big events here. <laughs> uh, Super Bowl's done. Daytona 500's next. It's one of the best times of year. We're going to have March Madness right around the corner. Uh, I know everybody gets sad when the NFL ends, but there's still a lot of good sports on. And honestly, I know it used to be where there would be a two-week gap between the Super Bowl and the Daytona 500. And like for us, like as people who are like doing a lot of research, that would have been nice. But like as a sports fan, from that perspective, it's really great to have something to look forward to on Sunday, despite the fact there's no NFL. Yeah. And for us NASCAR guys, it's great when it's, uh, you know, conference championship clash, right. Super Bowl, Daytona. Right. It's pretty good. It's, it's a good deal. Clash is weird this year with the schedule change. Couldn't get any like, you know, extra outrights or in, in, anything like that in there. But uh, Denny Hamlin coming through at least to make it a little bit sweeter and uh, be prevent me from losing money elsewhere. So thank you to exactly. uh, NASCAR for saving me in that regard. As mentioned for today, we're going to go through the Daytona 500 from all angles with, with Nick getting his read on how he plays things for Daytona, things to know, and he tweaks he's made in the next-gen era uh, since they changed the cars over for the Cup Series at Daytona to get you ready for Sunday's race. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up later on this week, we're going to talk some NBA All-Star festivities with Tom Vecchio, get his read on where he's seeing value there this weekend. We'll talk some EPL with Austin Cass, of course. I'm going to talk uh, NASCAR Truck Series and Xfinity Series on Friday as well, let you know where I'm seeing value in my model of FanDuel Sportsbook for those two races. So a lot of good stuff still coming up here the rest of this week on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating. And of course, you can find the show on the FanDuel YouTube page and over on FanDuel TV+. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and much more. Just visit FanDuel.com in the app and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sports book partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only, $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER over the FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and Vermont. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 over the ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700 visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana, Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland, 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia, 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-HOPE-NY or text OPEN-Y in New York. Now, Nick, we're going to break down the Daytona 500 here in just one second, but first... Because I've got you here, selfishly, I want to pick your brain on other stuff beyond just Daytona. Are there any drivers you're specifically looking to buy into this year, whether it be championship futures or potentially outrights once we're at the non-drafting tracks that are on the schedule? 
Yeah. Uh, so I think really um, I'm buying into uh, Denny Hamlin this year. He's just like the Toyota. We're, we got to talk about, you know, their new body. Um, I think that's going to help them, of course. But Denny Hamlin, he's a guy that just consistently wins year after year after year. Uh, and he's just probably, in my opinion, the best driver in NASCAR, uh, along with Kyle Larson, I would say, at this point in time. I think those two are the best. Uh, certainly, they've had their own run-ins before. And uh, I'm just really high on Denny Hamlin this year, partly because I like the, the Toyota body. Uh, and, you know, Chevy right now, they're just standing pat, so they're not really making any progress with a new body or anything like that. Uh, and then maybe as far as newcomers, I'm pretty high on John Hunter and yeah. in that Toyota camp, uh, you know, of the, the rookies or the younger drivers. Uh, I think he may have the best path to success here with Toyota only having eight full time cars. Sounds like Legacy Motor Club is going to get near first rate treatment. Uh, so I think that's uh, a really good sign for a guy who's already been in the Cup Series for a year before now, albeit not in the next gen car. Uh, so there may be a little adaptation period there. But I think the second half of the season, John Hunter and Nemechek could be somebody that surprises. And then finally, I'm going to go with another Toyota driver, Ty Gibbs. Uh, we saw him in the clash. Uh, this is the third year kind of full time for him. Uh, second and a half ish year, if you want to call it that, because he uh, was in that 2311 car for the latter half of, of the season two years ago. But every single Joe Gibbs racing driver in their first two full time seasons has won other than either J.J. Yaley and Daniel Suarez. And uh, while I love both of those drivers, they aren't, they didn't have the elite talent that Ty Gibbs showed in the Xfinity Series. Guys like uh, Christopher Bell has shown, like Joey Logano had shown back in the day, uh, or Denny Hamlin, you know, every single driver, whether they were coming in as a rookie uh, or, a, or a younger driver, and maybe like Christopher Bell came in in the second year, right, raced a year at uh, Levine Family Racing. Uh, but every single driver, whether they're a veteran or a rookie, has won in their first two full-time years other than those two drivers I mentioned for Joe Gibbs Racing. I was actually watching uh, a pertinent driver for that, uh, re related to that. I was watching the 2018 Daytona July race this morning uh, where Eric Jones beat out Martin Truex Jr. I was looking for Truex reasons, but like... Um, it brings back that because that was his second year with Joe Gibbs Racing. Mm -hmm. So similar thing there. I actually think that Jones would be pretty interesting this year too uh, yep. with Legacy now actually getting support. Whereas last yeah. year they were kind of in limbo the entire year. But glad you mentioned Denny Hamlin because I think that he's a really interesting guy. Now, Nick, I don't tend to bet a lot of championship futures personally uh, just because it's a long time to lock up bankroll because that's not going to ca get cashed out until November. And realistically the clv you're gonna get uh entering phoenix is not that great so personally i'm not willing to bite a plus 750 but like i think if you force me to bet someone hamlin is where i would go do you think that number is fair a bit undervalued for hamlin what do you said on that number yeah just like you i'm not a big championship futures guy um although i did take a few last year i, I did like truex william byron and Ryan Blaney uh, last year. And so that worked out pretty well. But uh, I actually don't hate Denny Hamlin at, at seven and a half to one uh, or whatever number you can find out there. I don't hate it. I'm not betting it myself yeah. uh, because similar reasons. It's just so hard to win a championship. And you can always make the argument that, uh, you know, Denny Hamlin maybe hasn't been the most clutch driver. He's been in the championship how many times and right. had the opportunity in the older chase format how many times and, and never got it done. Uh, so you can always make that argument, but that also comes down to a, a little bit of randomness, a little bit of bad luck, a little bit of sample size uh, issues there. So I don't hate seven and a half to one, but not on it myself. I agree with that assessment. I'm glad you mentioned Ty Gibbs. I was so mad when he was like running out front in the clash. It's like, oh, they're going to skewer his outright numbers early yeah. on the year. But luckily, didn't get the job done there. So hopefully that keeps a little bit lighter on the sports book side of things uh, for the first couple of non-pack races. Yeah. Let's talk now about Daytona process because it's a very unique track, a very unique race from what people may have bet if they've been betting NASCAR before, but not at Daytona. So if people are diving into NASCAR betting for the first time, what should they know about this track before they place any wagers? Yeah, so Daytona, along with Talladega, is one of two tracks uh, on the circuit. There's three now, but uh, two that I really kind of grouped together uh, as the really large super speedways. Uh, and so what NASCAR does is they have these teams use a tapered spacer to restrict airflow to the engine. It used to be a restrictor plate, now it's a tapered spacer. Um, and they had to do some other aerodynamic changes to kind of slow these cars down, create a lot of drag, let them run in a big pack. And that pack racing style, it 
obviously leads to a lot of randomness because you're all right there. All 40 cars can run together in this pack. It's rare these days, especially that we'll see drivers lose the pack. Uh, maybe early in the race, if they're having a little bit of handling issues or they just, you know, they're getting close to the end of a stage or have a bad pit stop. But by and large in that final stage, we're not really getting cars losing the draft. Uh, so you have every single healthy car under a blanket, uh, and chaos can happen. Uh, if one guy makes a mistake, there's nowhere to go for everybody else, but specifically Daytona, even more so than Talladega track position matters a whole lot, especially with this car, just because, um, it's not as wide. Handling matters a little bit more, uh, and it's uh, just a, a tougher spot to make moves and to get that third lane of racing going. So um, I think Daytona is is a spot where certainly track position will come into play. I was rewatching 2010, and Kurt Busch was sitting there inside the top three or four, and there was a late caution. He came in for tires and was just done. And I'm like, oh, my God, for like a green-white checkered finish, yeah. for an overtime finish. And he was just done. And uh, Jamie McMurray stayed out, started up in the front three rows and ended up winning the race on a double over. I think it was double overtime finish. Um, there was a restart with two to go. And then there was another restart. And then I can't remember if there's another restart, but I don't know if that counts as double or triple or single overtime, but you get the idea. Uh, track position is going to matter a lot here, I think. Uh, and I'm glad you didn't mention 2009 because that one is particularly upsetting for me as an Elliott Sadler fan where he had right. the lead with a couple of laps left, got passed by Matt Kenseth. Um, so I'm glad that you did not mention that one as opposed to uh, 2010. <laughs> now, you mentioned track position, and that's important here. And I think it's become even more important in the next gen era. They've had this these new cars for now two years. So a four-way sample at Daytona, and it seemed like this package specifically has made it really tough to pass. So... Have you altered anything with like the way you handicap these races, given what we've seen so far during the next gen era? Yeah, actually, I have. Um, it, I agree with you. I think it is a lot harder to pass in these cars. I remember the late Gen 6 era from like 2019 to 2021. And they were just talking about the monstrous runs yeah. these cars would get. And, you, and we saw that one huge crash where Joe was going to flip on the Bubba Wallace's roof or whatever. Um, these cars were just getting ridiculous runs and now they go to the the next gen and we're not quite getting the same runs uh at, and it is a lot harder to pass it's harder to make that third lane uh, even at talladega right. that third lane only comes in a lot of times when the bottom two lanes are saving fuel um so it's uh just it, it's a much tougher uh way to pass and what that does is it does elevate the favorites or the better cars a little bit but that said there's still a lot of randomness we've still seen uh 30 to 1 or longer long shots win both daytona 500s in the next gen era so uh it it, it doesn't mean these smaller teams or these uh mid-pack drivers can't win um, but I do think it skews the odds more so towards the the favorites and the, the drivers in good cars, maybe even in the mid tier uh, a lot more. And I think that's going to be the theme you hear from me is uh, betting that mid tier uh, for, for this Daytona 500 and, and for just this kind of racing right now. Now, you did mention that the favorites are a bit more viable than they may have been another time. So let's take a look at the odds right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Top of the chart is Ryan Blaney, 9-1. to one. For me, that's too short. I always love Blaney. Not this week uh, for me personally. Any value in the favorites for you with what you're seeing right now? Uh, no, I, I don't have value in the favorites, even in the next-gen era. Yeah. Uh, the the I remember last year, my Daytona 500 model, the highest win probability I had was something like 6.8%, yep. uh, something like that, which is just not going to get it at 14 to 1. Uh, I It may be a little higher this year just because we now have more data and we have seen the favorites do a little bit better uh, on these drafting tracks, but uh, I, I still don't believe I will be touching anybody 14 to 1 or shorter. Now, you mentioned the mid-pack as being kind of the spot you're more so living in. So let's talk about the mid-pack. When you're looking at the drivers who are not the favorites, a little bit longer odds, you mentioned around 14 to 1 is potentially being the tipping point where you can start to at least consider guys. Who stands out to you as being a good value right now? Yeah, I'm going to look, like I said, in that mid-pack, um, guys like Martin Truex Jr., Tyler Reddick, uh, here Bubba Wallace, 20 to 1. Uh, all these guys are on big teams. You can look maybe at a guy like Austin Sindrick, Ty Gibbs. Uh, there's a whole bunch of guys, Ross Chastain, in this 
20 to 35 range. Uh, you know, I think I've seen an Alex Bowman 35 to one out there. Uh, that kind of range, like especially if you can get some of these guys at 25 or, or 28 or 30 to one uh, and then 35 to one. I really like that range. Plus, uh, you know, the Stuart Haas drivers, Chase Briscoe, Ryan Priest. You can get them in the 40s or 50s even uh, depending on where you're, you know, where you're ma making your bets. And I think that's just uh, the, the sweet spot for value. You're getting big teams, big drivers on big teams uh, that are in double digit odds range, um, like way mid double digit odds range, not just like 14 or 16. Uh, so I think this is the range I'm going to be targeting this year uh, with my Daytona 500 outright bets. Anyone specifically you're most keen on in this range? Because to me, it actually is a guy you alluded to in Ryan Priest. He's 50 to one at FanDuel Sportsbook. That is the best number I've seen so far. Uh, I think he's as short as like 35, some other spots. And he's at Stuart Haas Racing. He ran well on pack tracks at JTG Doherty Racing back in the day. Obviously had that massive flip here back in the summer last year. But I like the talent. I don't think SHR can get much worse from like an organizational perspective. I like a, an equipment quality perspective. Results may yeah. get worse because there's no Kevin Harvick. But I think you'd eventually expect, given the money there is in that team, there to be some sort of uptick the support they get from Ford. So I think Priest is pretty interesting at 50 to 1. Anyone specifically you think is, is super intriguing right now? Um, you know, I always... and. He's over, but I always gravitate towards Martin Truex Jr. at these tracks. He's so good at these tracks. He just hasn't had the results. He will often come through the field, find his way towards the front, and then something will happen. Uh, so I gravitate towards him, uh, and that's why he ends up floating into the 30s sometimes. So he's not right now in the 30s, but if he falls back into the 30s, maybe after qualifying or the duels, I'll certainly be looking to grab him again. Um, and then, uh, like you mentioned, Ryan Priest, Chase Briscoe. I, I know I've seen Chase Briscoe in the 40s. Um, both of those guys certainly intrigue me, just like you said, from the Stuart Haas perspective. Even Noah Gregson, he's had some good yeah. super speedway runs in Xfinity and he was battling Ross Chastain for a win in the Cup Series uh, at a Super Speedway one year before they got together, and uh, you know that started their little feud. Uh, so, it, I don't hate these Stuart Haas racing drivers. Um, I, I particularly like uh, Gregson, um, Briscoe, and Priest, like you said. Not not as high on Josh Berry. I haven't really seen enough from him on the Super Speedways uh, specifically, but I, I'm right with you there. So I think I just named a whole bunch of drivers. I didn't I didn't do a very good job of narrowing it to <laughs> one or two. But that's kind of how I feel about this race. I love the mid pack. I like Tyler Reddick. He's there's I think a thirty to one out there on him. I I like Ty Gibbs and thirty to one. You know, it's there's I'm just probably going to end up firing this mid pack based off what I see in the duels. Yeah, and I think that the Gregson one is a good call out too because I actually I had to pick who I wanted to zero in on because I don't want to have too many outrights because obviously those bets cannot cash simultaneously. So it is really picking and choosing. I've got value in Eric Jones, 30 to one um, value on Priest, as mentioned at 50 to one Gregson is 60 to one. I have him at 2.2%. His implied odds are 1.6% yeah. at 60 to one. And like you said, the, the numbers on him and Xfinity are pretty good on the pack tracks. So I got, he got a win in Talladega, I think back mm -hmm. in 2022, and like this is better equipment than what he had last year at Legacy, given the situation that they were in with Chevrolet at that time. So the 60 to 1 on Gregson is interesting. I have not taken the plunge on that yet. I think the ones that I have are uh, Priest. I think I got 40, so I didn't get the best number there. Uh, I have Todd Gillen, 60, 65 to 1. If I were to add, I would give Gregson pretty long consideration there. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, and then right here in the middle of your graphic, uh, AJ Allmendinger is now down to 60 to one. I grabbed him at 80 to one yesterday. I went back and looked for Talladega. My model had him at like 2.2% or something. Uh, so 80 to one is great. There's no reason he shouldn't be too far off of that number, especially at Daytona where uh, things are even more random. So um, AJ Allmendinger, I, I don't hate 60 to one. I certainly liked 80, 75 to one a lot better. Um, but uh, honestly, I don't hate 60 to one. And he's a guy who has done well on pack tracks consistently, whether it be yeah. previously in the Cup Series, in the Xfinity Series, had some wins at Talladega and stuff, and then also back in the Cup Series too. So last Dingers, year, yeah. Six, yeah, six in this race last year, third at Atlanta. Um, so he's still shown he's he's got it at these pack races. Absolutely. Now, what about the non-outrights? Where are you seeing value there right now? Uh, yeah, so the non-outrights, I think, is a lot of fun. Um, there's a lot of different markets out there. For me, uh, remember how I just rattled off three Stuart Haas racing drivers? I like Stuart Haas to win at 12 to 1. If we just do a little math here, uh, they're going to make up 
10% of the field, four of the 40 cars. And right there, if, if they were just the average car to win, uh, then they should be nine to one as fair odds because that is 10% implied probability. And I think they're maybe at worst the average car when we think about it. I mean, we've got three or four elite teams, um, but that makes up less than half the field. And then they're right there. They're the next team. Uh, and there's a lot of guys that have very, I, I shouldn't say a lot, but there's a few guys that have very low win probability that, that'll make the race. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, one of the BJ McLeod cars or, um, you know, whether it's uh, the the JJ Yaley car that we've just got news on today entering in New York racing, there will be some guys that have very low win probability, maybe the Rick Ware guys. Uh, so that elevates all these other favorites even more. So I think Stuart Haas racing at 12 to one um, is arguably one of my, my favorite bets right now. But if I had to make a bet before seeing cars on track in, in the duels. Yeah. The applied odds of 12 to one are 7.7%. I have them at 8.4%. So above that it's in part because I got the value on Priest and Gregson specifically, mm -hmm. but you know, Briscoe and Barry could get the job done. I agree with your assessment of barrier. I'm not as high on him, but looping together Gregson and Priest is pretty interesting. So I do also show value on them. And it that goes with the strategy of firing maybe like your true X Reddick, Ty Gibbs, Alex Bowman, and then Stuart Haas racing. And right. you could build a really nice card on that. Right. Absolutely. And it allows you again to, to double dip on guys you show value on, which is something I'm always gonna be in favor of. You can do that sometimes with like a uh, number of race winner bets, uh, odd, even rate, uh, race winning number and stuff like that. Uh, that's a good way to kind of get a bundle effectively on different drivers you may show value on, which is something I'm always in favor of. Yeah, exactly. And then, um, you know, there's always these interesting ones. I know you and I talked about it last night. We were talking about, uh, well, Toyota number of Toyotas to finish inside the top 10 over one and a half. You know, that looks interesting, uh, given that there are now nine potentially Toyotas in this race at minimum eight. Yeah. Uh, and so just all sorts of like shop around, look at, um, where, things may be mispriced just based off of uh, incorrect sample sizes or something like that. You know, if books are going back 10, 15 years to analyze the Daytona 500, well, we had a bunch of snooze fests uh, in right. the late, you know, mid, mid, late nineties, uh, or I should say uh, teens. And then the early two thousands, I know Denny Hamlin had a couple of years where he uh, led over 90 laps twice in back-to-back -back years, but that's changed. That's shifted. Uh, so there's just a lot of, um, you know, props that will become available as the week goes on, uh, whether they're at FanDuel or elsewhere. Uh, I know FanDuel last year had a lot of really good props. I was able to, you know, uh, win a few of those bets at yep. FanDuel. So um, just shop around. I think as we get closer and closer to race time, we'll get more and more bets. Uh, but my favorite one right now, like I said, uh, on a non outright would be Stuart Haas racing to win a 12 to 1. One thing you mentioned there was the lap leader thing and how there were snooze fests back in the day. Uh, the number that we had was 73 and a half for um, the lap led by the, the top driver. I think in this era where teams realize how important it is to save fuel and your fuel savings go out the out the door when you're yeah. leading the pack, it makes way more sense to take the under on that number because teams do not have an incentive to be the number one car in that pack where their their fuel their fuel efficiency goes way down. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, that and um, it's just not as important to uh, lead laps, yeah. given the current setup of how you get into the playoffs. You know, right. back in the day, leading laps, points. you get five bonus points, yeah. you get uh, another five for leading the most, that kind of thing. It's just there's not the incentive there like there used to be. Um, and I know we're talking like way long ago, but uh, still, um, I we haven't had a, a driver in the next gen era lead more than 67 laps at either Daytona or Talladega, not counting Atlanta because of the uh, mile and a half ish uh, kind of effect that goes into that one. But uh, at Daytona or Talladega, we've never had a driver lead more than 67 laps, uh, median 44 and a half or sorry, median 47, average 44 and a half, whatever it is, flip those numbers. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, you get the idea if 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 there's missed price lines out there, there will be um, there's yeah. going to be a lot of books. It's, it's the Super Bowl of NASCAR, right? So right. while it won't be as many prop bets as the Super Bowl has, because it's certainly much more of a niche market, it'll be the Super Bowl of betting for NASCAR because right. this will be the one race that has the most props available. Uh, so make sure to shop around and take advantage of them, especially as we get closer to race time.
yeah, it's something where you always want to take advantage of of markets that have not been back tested as much, uh, not have mm-hmm. been pounded into efficiency via the market, and we're going to get a lot more of those this week than we typically will when it comes to betting on NASCAR. That yeah, is, and Jim, yeah, real quick, one more thing. Yeah, uh, if we look at group bets, right? Like yeah. this is this race is so inherent, uh, so random uh, that uh, a lot of these groups, four car groups. Every driver should just be 25% to win ballpark, right? right? And so if you see something that's a bit longer than three to one, uh, especially significantly longer than three to one, almost probably should bet it unless there really is a major driver discrepancy. Yeah, like I was looking at one for Xfinity where it's Jeb Burton plus 340 and Jeb literally won a pack race last year. So stuff like that. That's yes. I think it's that. And then also like matchups. If you get plus money on one side, Mm -hmm. it's not an auto bet, but it is one. Look I would I, like I look for those and then I dig in. Yeah. I don't bet a lot of them, but like I do dig in to see, OK, is this a value of something that I care about? Because it's going to be roughly 50 50 most of the time for most of those matchup. Bets. Exactly. All righty. That is Dr. Nick Giffen. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Rotodoc. Find his work at the Action Network as well. The uh, Running Hot podcast and the Stacking Denny's podcast. Nick, it was a pleasure as always. Good luck to you and enjoy the racing this weekend. Hopefully this weekend and not on Monday. Yeah, have fun, everybody. It's uh, best race of the year. All righty. Again, find Nick on Twitter at Rotodoc. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. You can find me on threads at Jim.Sonis. And check out FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Back again tomorrow, talking the NBA All-Star festivities with Tom Vecchio. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 